Thank you very much, Anthony, for, for being here. We are here with Anthony Hook, which is a former member of the European Parliament for the United Kingdom. Uh, he was in the Renew Europe group. He was one of uh, uh, the young MEPs part of the U40 family. We are very happy to have you here, Anthony. How are you? I'm very good, Alessandro. It's good to see you again. It's very, it's very good indeed. So listen, um, I have a few questions for you for today. Um, our conversations are very informal, uh, so feel free to, to jump in uh, uh, whenever, whenever you feel like. Um, I would start by the first question, which is uh, uh, how did you actually get in the European Parliament and how was your experience, even though it was uh, short? Uh, did you, do you have a good memory of it uh, and uh, how, was, uh, how was life? So being a member of the European Parliament was fascinating and rewarding. It is by far the most interesting work I've, I've done. And I would strongly encourage any young Europeans who are interested in politics and current affairs to think about either working at the European Parliament because MEPs need good assistance and good policy advisors to make them more effective. And I was very lucky to have a good team around me and also to stand for election themselves to the European Parliament or to other bodies too, because we really need uh, young people to use their voice and to take part in these uh, decisions. And I have a very warm memory of the European Parliament and I, I always will. I just deeply regret that Britain is no longer in the EU and we're not able to take part in these decisions. But I think we will be again. I think it will be 10 to 15 years, but I think Britain will return to its place in Europe. Yeah, we do share the same hope. Uh, uh, I Before we actually get to Brexit, which was something that really uh, affected not only you as a member of the European Parliament, but the entire United Kingdom, and I would go even farther me as an Italian and as a European, strongly European, I, I felt it very much. Uh, before going into that, I, I wanted to pick up on something that you just said. So uh, how was your experience of actually standing up and running for the European Parliament? What's, what were the reasons why you decided to join the Lib Dem and to run for a pro-European uh, force during a very complicated time for the United Kingdom? Well, I joined the Liberal Democrats quite a long time ago, in 1998, when I was first year at university. And um, for a whole host of reasons, many different issues um, attracted me to the Liberal Democrats. Um, it's a very internationalist party. And when I was a teenager in the 1990s, a big issue uh, at the time was the civil war in the former Yugoslavia. And the Liberal Democrat leader, Paddy Ashdown, was the uh, foremost politician in Britain who was calling for intervention to say that genocide is not something we should be seeing in Europe today and we should be more active in doing something about it. And there was a moral dimension to the way Paddy Ashdown viewed issues that, as an idealistic young person, I found and still find very attractive. And the Liberal Democrats were also leading the way on calling for modernising our constitution and for um, a fairer balance in the way society was run, both socially and economically. And I'd lived, I was born in 1980, so I'd lived my whole life under the Conservative governments of Margaret Thatcher and John Major, where public services were cut year on year to the point when I was a teenager in the 90s and going to school and your school buildings falling down, the ceiling coming down in the middle of your lesson was becoming like a normal thing. And the Liberal Democrats were really clear that we needed to invest more money in good schools and hospitals. So that was something that attracted me too. So I, I joined the party at university and then probably about 10 years after that, I first thought about standing for the European Parliament. So that would have been about 2007. And something that's quite important to understand is the electoral system we use for European elections 
a proportional representation is completely different to the electoral system the UK uses for its national elections, which is called first past the post, where it's completely disproportionate. So typically a party might get, as Boris Johnson did, about 42%, but end up with 60, 70% of the seats. The votes and the, the seats have no correlation in a way that's quite undemocratic. And it's very difficult for Liberal Democrats to get elected to our national parliament. We, we typically get, uh, even in a bad year, we get 10 or 11%. On a good year, we've had 20, 22%, but not had anywhere near the number of seats of that. But around 2007, one of the Liberal Democrat MEPs for the South East, Emma Nicholson, indicated she was going to um, not stand for re-election in 2009. So I took part in the nomination contest and the way our candidates are nominated is democratic. So party members mm -hmm. have a vote on who the candidates are. It's not just decided by the party leader. And we have in the southeast of England um, about, uh, at the moment, about 20,000 party members. So I was very young. I was only in my mid-20s at that time. And I took part in that contest and we had a list of 10 candidates for the southeast region and I uh, came fifth on the list which was not a place where I was going to be elected and instead Catherine Bearder took over Emma Nicholson's seat but um, it was very interesting and I thought yeah I, I want to do this again and I'd only had a short run in whereas other candidates mm -hmm. have been working on it for many years so the next part of the story was that the next year connected in 2014. I spent that time from 2009 to 2014 getting to know all the Liberal Democrat members across the Southeast, going to help their local campaigns. And then I was nominated in 2014 as number two on the list. And uh, I should have taken over from an MEP called Sharon Bowles, who was president of Econ. But the Liberal Democrats at that time had gone into government with the Conservatives and have become quite unpopular. Our poll ratings had really hit the floor because we had been seen to break a number of promises that we'd made before the 2010 national election. And one of the things that is very true about British politics, I'm not sure where this is with other member states, is most people in Britain focus on the national election and they use European elections and local elections to some extent to take out their feelings about the national things. So quite often, sadly to say, when a lot of people in Britain would go to vote in the European election, they're not necessarily thinking about who's going to be my best MEP. They're actually thinking about, do I like the Prime Minister? Am I fed up with the Prime Minister? And vote to try and send that message. So we lost almost all our seats in 2014. We went from, I think... 10 or 11 down to just one, which was devastating. And Catherine Bearder was that one. So uh, 2014, though, I didn't feel too bad about it. I was still only quite young. I was in my early 30s. Um, I had another career as a criminal lawyer, which I found and still find really interesting. I thought I will work on being an even better, stronger candidate and come back in 2019. Then the Brexit referendum happened. I was very involved in the Brexit campaign, took part in lots of debates in villages and towns all across the southeast. And I was devastated when we lost the referendum by a very narrow margin. And I am certain that if that question was put back to the British people today, or even in 2017, 2018, you get a different result. There were a lot of people who voted leave who are now very angry at the way Brexit hasn't worked out the way they were promised it would. And I even know people who voted leave, mm -hmm. not wanting to leave, didn't think leave would win. They just wanted to um, not support David Cameron, but didn't actually think it would put in danger our place in Europe. Uh, but then the uh, Brexit was delayed. Theresa May failed to uh, get it through because the Conservative Party was split and really disagreeing with itself. So we got a chance at the 2019 European elections, and I was really proud to be at that point elected as an MEP for the South East. And uh, we used the time we had to try and stop Brexit and to do good work on other issues up until 
31st of January. Yeah, it's actually very fascinating to hear uh, a bit of history and your story within within that history. Because um, it is always like uh, for us, uh, political nerd, the political geeks, it's uh, it's always like uh, words on paper, but then actually associating faces and stories to, to those uh, to those words is very interesting. Um, you said something very interesting, which is, uh, I, I believe it's actually true. So the first point is uh, national uh, and European get mixed up during European elections. And uh, being an Italian, I, I have seen it in the past uh, elections very much with the, with the anti-European movements. Um, the second part that I, I would like to get your feedback on is uh, on the Brexit referendum. I, it was uh, devastating for, for us young Europeans to see the result of that referendum in 2016. Uh, I fully agree if it was reproposed uh, later on, uh, probably something would have changed because if I remember correctly, about 75% of the people younger than 30 were voting for remaining, but then the problem is that they didn't go to vote. So what was the problem there? Why did young people not go to vote much and how can we solve that, that situation? That's a really good question, uh, as Andre. And there's um, an issue with young people not voting in as high numbers as old people in all types of elections. And it's very complicated as to why that is. But I think the solution involves communicating to young people why voting matters, how it can affect your life, how the outcome will have an impact on your future. I think actually, in a way, the Brexit referendum has illustrated that to people which is good um is one good thing coming out of a bad situation i think it also depends on political leaders reaching out to younger people talking about issues that they care about and in a way that matters to young people i have found as a political candidate that when i go to talk to different groups of members of the public young people tend to be more idealistic than older people. Quite often, if you talk to an older audience about a particular policy, the very first question they've got, which is a legitimate, important question, is how much would it cost and how will we pay for it? <laughs> With younger audiences, that question comes up later. And their earlier questions are things like, is this right or wrong? Will it benefit everyone? How will it affect the environment if we do this particular thing that's under discussion? And so it needs politicians to bear those frames in mind and to talk about issues in a frame that captures the imagination of younger people. Yes, I, I actually uh, fully agree with you. Um, it's also like the nice part of being young. You, you can afford to be a bit more idealistic and think of what is right and what is wrong more than, uh, uh, than the, the rest of the population. Uh, so, look, I've seen actually um, uh, that uh, you have put a banner on uh, top of a cliff in the south part of, uh, of England uh, saying we still love you, which is quite interesting. It was quite well uh, uh, perceived in Europe. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, on behalf of the EU40 community, we love you too, and we still hope uh, that this is going to, to be, uh, you're going to be back soon. Um, in this regard, so Brexit uh, happened, or let's say it's still happening, but as of the 31st of January, you're no longer a member of the European Parliament. What has changed for the United Kingdom? And do you think that in light of the current pandemic, the United Kingdom could have had a better uh, response or would have uh, benefited from being part of the EU? Mm. It's very worrying from a British point of view because um, right now, uh, I saw in the newspaper this morning, Britain has had more fatalities than any mm -hmm. Western country apart from the United States. And okay, the UK is a big country in population, but even in terms of um, a ratio of the number of deaths to size of population, we're in about the top four or so countries, developed countries in the world. And this question has got to be investigated. I don't know the answer right now myself, but it seems to me that uh, as soon as the pandemic is finished or, or even earlier than that, there needs to be an independent investigation into 
why have more people died in our country than in other countries? And one thing that's quite worrying, there's a, a politician called Philip Lee, who was a conservative, and he joined the Liberal Democrats last year. And he used to be a health minister. And he said that around, I think it was 2016, they did, the government did a pandemic kind of test, a trial run. And he says there's a report that says our systems are not adequate for dealing with a pandemic. And it made a number of recommendations to change things that were just not acted on. The report was just put on a shelf and ignored. And if that's true, and I'm sure it is true, because I find Philip the a very reliable spokesperson, that is damning. And someone in due course needs to be held account. We've got a real problem with leadership at the moment in Britain because Boris Johnson's style, his personality is very imprecise and he entertains people. A lot of people like him because he's funny and he's got personality and he gives the impression that he doesn't care what other people think. He's just comfortable with being himself and people find that a very attractive quality. And in some ways, that's how he got Brexit through. Yes. He got people, don't think too much about it. You know, just have a good laugh with me and have an emotional reaction. But with something like COVID-19, you, you can't bluff COVID-19. You can't beat COVID-19 with a good joke book. It needs science. And last night, he gave a broadcast to the nation which this morning is just being slammed in every corner. My my social media feed is just full of people who are very angry, saying it's not clear what he was saying. Should we stay home? Should we go to work? Should we do something else? And it's not just my friends too. I have a lot of friends who obviously are very politically engaged and you would expect them to have that reaction. But also people who aren't normally that interested in politics are commenting on the prime minister's address last night and feeling very dismayed and very angry and let down at the lack of leadership he's showing yes that is a bit uh, i think the problem of uh, um, the personalization of politics on one side in electoral campaigns these people are great in getting votes because they are easier to vote let's say but then when it comes to content Uh, they lack. And so when they get in positions of power, uh, it's a bit more complicated because you can't bluff, you can't laugh, you can't uh, just use your words to get out of situations. So so in that sense, uh, I I, I tend to agree. Um, Super. Thank you very much for your your insights. Very last question, and then uh, we'll let you go, uh, would be, so what is the natural um, career path for a former MEP? What are your projects? What are you doing? Uh, I think many people are wondering what happens to a person that is uh, out there and maybe uh, all of a sudden is not anymore. So whether you have still uh, politics in your heart or whether you are going back to being a barrister or lawyer. So what's up? I feel like saying I'll let you know when I find out. (laughs) <laughs> because it's it's early days yeah and obviously COVID-19 has really affected things because um new projects are not starting and new jobs are not sort of advertising and so on mm-hmm. I'm doing some legal work my heart is still very much in politics because there are so many issues we need to fight for Brexit and reversing Brexit is one of them I think we've got a long-term project to take Britain back into Europe and I want to be involved in that. And there are other issues too. I'm also a local councillor and I was a local councillor before I was elected and I I stayed on with that role. If Brexit had been stopped, I I probably would have um, given up that role, enabled someone else to take over from me. But um, if I had resigned immediately, it would have caused what we call a by-election, a special election, which would have been very expensive. So I waited to see what happened. So I'm still serving my community as their local councillor. We won't have a national election for a few years now, probably not until 2024 in Britain. So I don't know whether I'll take part in that. Um, But uh, so I'm doing at the moment a mixture of legal work and a mixture of work as a local politician and seeing what happens. You mentioned before, Alessandro, my We Love EU banner. 
which was a great success. The banner, I can't remember the number of meters now, but it was about the size of a squash court, if you know wow. what I mean by, yes. by that. It was pretty big and it got some great pictures, uh, which people can see on my website, anthonyhook.org, O-R-G, um, on the cliffs. And we still got the banner. It's in storage. So I'm hoping later in the year to take it on a tour to some other locations in the UK to get the message out that there are lots of people in Britain who still want to value a really close relationship with Europe. Yes, and in this, uh, I think this note is a perfect note to end our conversation. Uh, in this case, I would like to tell you that uh, uh, in reversing Brexit, you will find our full support and the full support of many pro-Europeans, young uh, members of the European Parliament. Uh, we had a chat last week with Alexandra Phillips as well uh, from the yeah. Greens, uh, uh, still former member of the United Kingdom. But uh, I think everyone really of the EU40 family is happy to help you in, uh, in reverting Brexit. So That's Anthony, fantastic. thank you very much for your, uh, for your time. It was lovely to chat with you. I wish you all the best and uh, we keep in touch. Thanks, Alessandro. Thank you. Keep Have a nice touch. day. Thank Bye-bye. You.